It's um, my great pleasure to introduce Brendan, who is a uh, in his first season of production here in the Palm Island Center. Thanks for joining us. It's your presentation. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> Brendan Doyle, I'm the owner of the Great Marshall Company. We're a startup agriculture farm located in Bradley, Mass. Excuse me. And uh, we've just had our uh, first harvest this year. So we did our very first planting last uh, July, and we've been able to uh, produce a nice oyster crop this fall. We've been on pretty much a, a weekly, weekly to bi-weekly harvest schedule since about August, which is pretty amazing. Most times, people say it takes about two to three years to get to your first harvest. So uh, speaks a lot of the location we were lucky enough to. Use our, our logo, and I, I didn't bother to do a lot of uh, words on slides today. I figured I just talked through things. And we got some pictures. So this is a this picture right here is our location. We have uh, those two circles are, are both of our sites. So we had to for where we are, we had to get a separate overwintering area uh, to move our gear to for the winter, and then um, get that get that up. Um, Back. And that's what uh, me and my uh, farm manager here, Carl, is uh, sort of in the active process of uh, doing what we can out here. But maybe moving some cages um, from point A to point B. And that would be from the inside dot here, that circle where our, our camp and the um, main site is, out here to um, more the center of Plum Island Sound, get down for the winter, keep them away from the ice, keep them out, you know, safe from storms and stuff like that. And, Bit of a process, but uh, so you do. Um, so go on there. Uh, we do a couple of different. Uh, we uh, only want to shut down the consistent window there. Okay. Yeah, that moved to a different screen. Yeah, yeah. So there's a picture of our camp. That's our uh, Memorial Day flag display uh, this year. With the, our forces flags up to both uh, veterans. And then uh, it's kind of going down through. That's uh, just another. Great picture of the spot. It's a great spot to spend the night, stay out there um, for different reasons. Kind of gives you this picture, gives you kind of a view of the length of the property. So we're in a neat position out there. I actually own the property, unlike um, a lot of the places, especially if you've got ducks out of Cape. Um, they have the, the challenge that they're leasing, and they're leasing to the town. And leases can be, you know, non leasing uh, So there's been issues with leases, different places. Uh, we own our land, um, so from the BMO type mark up, uh, I have um, ownership rights, uh, which changes things a little bit. Um, I do lease a small portion of the um, water sheet from the town, um, at least the area in front of my camp. Um, that's my floating cages, the floating gear that we use. So that is out in the public domain, so you have to lease that from the town. Um, so you have to take the section of water from other people's use, marking that off for it. You have gear there. Impact with the boats and stuff like that. You have to be, you know, they just talk, uh, Chris was talking about the different, you know, hurdles you go through in the regulation process. One of those is um, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, you have to be X amount of feet from that little channel. So you have to make sure you have the rotations, you know, the good spot. Keep going with the uh, slide deck there. This is just a town map of the property, um, or past map. So you get that nice little peninsula there, so you see I own around the back as well. So I own to the center of the creek that goes up around me. I own to the low tide in front of the camp, in front of the property, and then to the center of the creek of Scarberry Inlet, which is a little bit down from me. It. So it's, it's, it's quite a nice spot as far as um, a mix of um, intertidal and then leasing that um, water sheet as well. So I have quite a, quite a bit of mudflat intertidal and uh, some deep salt marsh. Excellent. And like, like everybody, these are the oysters. Um, so those ones right there on the left, with the quarter, that's what I bought. I bought from Island Creek last year from their hatchery. And uh, we bought the largest, the first time oyster farmer, they said, so you buy the largest seed you possibly can. You don't buy too much to start. All right, so I bought 50,000 quarter inch seed last July. And that's, so I think. So the right is, um, Oh, October. 
So that was when I, the first dozen that we shot by October 11th. So that's the growth rate that we got. And then right down there at the bottom, it kind of blends into the counter a little bit. That's a, a native wild oyster that we pulled off the flat too. So we have some native, some wild native ones there, which is once more of a testament to the site because, you know, that site has a little bit of a native population. The Rowley River is so one of the last rivers that you can actually go find native oysters in, which is really interesting. We'd be talking with our hatchery about that and more details to go forward with the farm to build things up. Go to the next picture here. So then this was our first harvest. Um, so that was this year. So those same oysters after we overwintered them last year. Uh, so that was you know a little bit more late August up at the top there. And then our first um, harvest bag that was probably great late, late August, last couple of weeks in August. And then uh, yeah, this is more uh, closer to October, this last dozen here that we're enjoying. You have to remember, you know, uh, go with the old ECB phrase, you know, don't get high on your supply. That's their problem. That's definitely their problem. <laughs> so, once you have to maintain quality, you can see quality control is very important. <laughs> So, uh, next slide. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so here's our floating cage configuration. This is uh, kind of last year um, when we didn't have as many. That's like my first six floating cages, which is that uh, tiny. That's a very tiny farm setup. Uh, you know, if you look at Mook Seafood up in Maine, I think he's floating 1,200. So oh, wow. just to kind of get an idea of scale, uh, you, know, you can only do that. Um, you can only only float as many cages as you can fit in your setup. You can't, you know, it's a, it's a finite amount of space, and you try to make that finite amount of space work as best as you can to your maximum advantage. And so, let's go to the next slide. Um, do tubes too. Um, that's you see some people do the lines too. So we're, we're doing a mixture. We can do floating cages. We can do tubes. I can do bottom cage, bottom culture. Um, I could broadcast. Um, basically, I can do any type of aquaculture on my lease. That I want, but not really leaks on my land. Um, one of the advantages to me being in a town by town advantages in Rally Mass, Rally is a right to farm town. So in Rally, they have determined by town vote <laughs> that farming is more important than any kind of minor inconvenience that farmers can provide you. So if you end up driving in Rally and you start behind a hay wagon, going down the road real slow, <laughs> so you go a little slower today. Yeah. And that's you know protected by law, all forms of property. So as a right to farm town, you have one aquaculture is one of those farming rights and farming law. So that makes it a little bit easier in Raleigh to get through things, but you have to be a resident, you have to own land. So that's the difficult part of it. Finding a piece of land you can actually purchase. How many acres do you have? I've got 3.8. 3. Yeah. And there's a lot of it is one flat, so that's nice for me allows me these different setups. So this is really the first year stuff. Um, it's really experimental for me. You know, what's going to work here? What's not going to work here? My first set of um, floating bags that I configured, I had my oysters in those bags for a week, maybe, week and a half at most. And I just completely pulled them out and destroyed that whole setup. And that setup took me about a month and a half, two months to set up, figure out, plan, build. Get the materials, pay for it, do it all, and then no, this isn't going to work. We rip it apart the bags with what we call the plant. The current I have in there is just too strong for it. So I switched it out. Now I've got these oyster tubes. It performs the same function for the oyster, the oyster farming. It tumbles with the tide. So the tide does some of your work, body builds your oysters, breaks off the fine little edges so they, they clench and they grow in that right shape. Because your, your goal is that um, perfect half shell. And because he showed you the example of lots of the towns where, like, Well Fleet has a lot more farmers uh, making as much money as upstairs, you can do the same kind of crop and make 40 cents an oyster. You do the same kind of crop and you can make a dollar ten, dollar twenty inch. You put them in about the same amount of labor, the amount of effort, you're just doing it a little different, a little smarter. You're able to do it that kind of thing. That's what we're very lucky with our spot is one. We've got that great current flow where, yeah, I may have had to modify some gear to work with the current, but that current brings so much nutrients across my oysters every day. Just, and now having the tubes, 
tubes are hard sided, so they're, they're wired. And they got a wire divider down the center. So when they tumble up and down the tide, they won't compress, they won't bend, they won't bend, so they won't get put pressure on the oysters when they're in there. And that's the key to these oyster tubes. So we're going to double down on those next year, maybe triple, maybe quadruple down, um, depending how well, you know, a lot of dynamics, a lot of uh, going to be ready to, to you know, go with, go with the um, flow of things. Something not working, adjust it. You know, they, everybody would say, you don't try to make your site work how you want it to work. You go with what your site is going to do. You know, it's the same thing when we're working with the cages, you got to get out there in the boat, flip the cages, you got to do a lot of maintenance on the oysters, a lot of tending. Um, you know, you don't fight the tide. We go with the tide. We let the tide work us back, work us out, depending on the way the tide's going. You know, you tie the boat up to the cage, and then you work that line down, let the tide bring you down the cages. Don't try to go against the tide if you can't help it. Uh, the wind, you know, wind and tide, some days you just gotta say, this is too much out there. You know, you're not gonna, you're just gonna get hurt. You're gonna go out there and, you know, things are banging around too much. So you gotta be careful with that. But um, it, it's definitely been, a, been an adventure so far, for sure. We go ahead to the next slide here. So we have the tubes, we have that, we're doing co-hogs. So we have clam nets. Uh, these are the co-hogs I purchased a couple of years ago. Fortunately, that crop didn't do so well. Um, but we slide two. So we're doing the claim nets for those. Um, yeah, so that was a disappointing crop. I don't know exactly what happened, uh, but we gave it another shot this year. I uh, got some more co-ops again this year, did a different, a little bit different, a little bit different monitoring on them. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, go from there, you know, we could put a hundred thousand out there. We're also fish green crabs, and that's uh, one of the things that me and Ann have been talking about. You know, green crabs and how what we can do about that problem. Green crabs are a big problem to my oysters, a big problem to the farm. They eat the baby shellfish, they, they're a big problem up in the marsh. They're invasive species, but they're established. They're here to stay. They're not, you're not going to get wrecked. Um, so, how do we deal with them? You know, I fish them uh, and then, you know, get them out. Uh, just like, hey, you find fossils on your gear, or a little bit of muscles in the weed, right? So, they just, you know, <laughs> going to be ready to adapt to this stuff. But these, uh, these crabs are very, very, uh, Voracious, they, they eat a lot and they're everywhere. They're just, it's amazing how many are out there. That that trap right there in the center is pretty full and that's on, you know, less than a day set. You know, I'll probably set that and haul that in the morning to the pitch as an example for how many we can get. The problem there is we have no source to um, send them. You know, so I can, I can fish for them, then what do I do with them? And that's something we're working on. Um, that's where. You know, and we're trying to talk about fertilizer, organic fertilizer with that. Um, you know, but then there's economics of that that you have to work out. You know, there's no easy solutions to anything. Um, but there are some solutions. Uh, we're talking to other people about pet food. Uh, that might be a, a thing. Uh, really, we need the infrastructure too. It's just not just the source to get rid of them. Uh, a lot of people right now that fish green crabs with a lot of clam diggers in Gloucester that also fish green crabs, take clams. But they're all individuals, and literally, we're, we're fighting against each other. You know, we fight for, for dealers, we fight for bait, we try to, you know, everything is just that, you know, if we had a, a more of a, a communal sense to it, um, you know, in a localized place, we could bring the crabs in order for them to have, you know, one truck a day pick them up and go to Boston. That's a big deal, you know, because everybody individually, you know, you may not realize, but some days, some guys are looking for some money and they're kind of, you know, willing to go the extra mile per se. <laughs> they drive a you know a truck with way too much weight in it down 128 to just go do a little green crab somewhere. You know, a pickup truck. It's like it's, you know everybody's an individual, and it's like okay, yeah, we can't be doing that. You know, we need to have you know there needs to be a place for a commercial truck that can actually take that kind of weight and do things. Get you know do it right. Um, but there's without the market being really established, you don't get that stuff. So it's it's a very side thing. We do it just because. Um, you know, it's predator control for us, and if we can make 50 cents a pound, we're, we're happy. We make, if we were making last year, we we're making 50 cents a pound, the guy was meeting us at the dock. Beautiful. So, we just right off the boat, right onto the truck, they're off our hands, get a little money, go back up. What we got to do for the take the tanks, we got to shelter the truck. So, um, it's, it's an ongoing thing, but um, this is a good picture of the current layout. So, that first picture of the farm with floating cages, so first six. So it's like uh, 40 some odd 
cages out there right now, 36 in the downstream and another 12 upstream. And then um, we have all the tubes that you can't quite see, they're underwater right now. And um, next year, we're gonna go ahead and expand more, but another 36 cages, another three strings of 12 to put out there. On top of that, go next page. Yeah, this is weird angle, it's kind of squished, but um, that's okay. This is the uh, picture of um, what I used in my permitting process. So that's the coordinates, my latitude longitude coordinates of my farm site. The white represents the floating cages on the least area of water sheet that I have. <clears throat> the green represents um, those tight tumbling flip up tubes. At that point, it's floating bags. Now it's tipped it, switched to the tubes. And then the orange represent areas I can put plant nets, or I was planning on putting plant nets. I can switch this around a lot now that you get through the initial round of permitting. You know, agriculture gear is now um, legally by the latitude longitude coordinates. So by those four points, any type of um, you know gear that I want, if I want, like I switch from the bags to the tubes, they're the same thing. It's just a round tube instead of a bag. Uh, but people get no qualification. It's like now um, under the Mass Waterways Law, those latitude longitude units are now considered land under agriculture control. So that's now an agriculture law. So then that, once you get through permitting, you get a little bit of a breather and okay, if I need to switch something around a little bit to make, you know, once again, what the site's gonna do versus what you want it to do. You know, you convert, convert to what nature's gonna allow on that site more than um, what you think you're gonna do. And, and that, that's a little bit more lenient once you get through the process, uh, but getting through the initial process as well. Um, and the, when I started, um, right before COVID hit, and then COVID hit, and I went through the process during COVID, which is fun. Um, that we didn't have the mass website yet. Yeah, that was still in construction. Uh, there was a beta version. I think I was one of the first people to do the beta version, uh, go through that. That was written. You started at, at the DMF. Um, and so it was like, I, had, I didn't have any of that to start with. So I had to kind of figure out most of it by myself at the beginning. And then I got connected to that beta version of the website. And that was just like, wow, where, where have we been all along? You know, this is like an amazing thing. This that website, the guide, and the, the, the way to walk through it and, and follow the process. And I did the process all on my own. Um, a lot of people hire consultants and all that, but that's pretty expensive. Um, so I did everything. I did. If you go to the next slide here, you see one of my no, no, I don't think I didn't include any of my, my visios for the gear and stuff, but this is this is the uh, level I had to go through for part of the process. This is a survey results. Um, we did um, bathymetric survey of the river bottom. We did a LIDAR survey for the plane, and we did a physical on-site regular survey of the building and all the structure that was on that wall. So that was a, that cost a pretty penny to get through that. And uh, with the purchase of the property and everything, it's been, it's been an interesting ride. <laughs> very expensive. Very expensive to get up and start a process and then quite a bit. So it's nice to finally get to that point where this fall I've been able to enjoy a little bit of money coming back in from the harvest. And we've also been very lucky where um, we've been in a partnership with Ipswich Shellfish. And Ipswich Shellfish has been very good to us. Um, we're very, very good um, business partner. And we'll take all the oysters I can bring. Everything. There's no, it's like you, whatever you have, you bring to which has been great, uh, really great. That's, that's, that's helped a lot. Um, so working with them, uh, we do some sustainability stuff with that. They're very big on the sustainable shellfish. Uh, we're the sustainability coordinator is how sustainable, you know, oysters are, how good they are for the environment. You know, one adult oyster can filter up to like 50 gallons of water a day. It moves a lot of nitrogen uh, from the water. And, uh, you know, they're delicious. People love them. So, yes. Uh, yes, very determined. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I guess if you haven't seen this one, this is my latest uh, very determined solution to an osprey nest. So we just put that up um, last weekend, which is great. Uh, I got to give a shout out to Dave Rimmer at the East Coast. Uh, it was Essex County Greenbelt Association. He uh, set that whole thing up. He did a fantastic job uh, with that osprey program. So they have another osprey nest he, he supports behind lobster land in Mac Roster. They've got the camera on that. You can go on their website. You can view the nest, view the hatchings and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. And um, he does this. This one we set up. He bought everything. 
that we needed. All the tools, the materials, we had the desk all built, the platform built together, and where we just had to put it, you know, just put the basic kit, thing, kit together. Everything was pre drilled, and I think in 45 minutes or so, we had that thing up. And we spent a lot of time BSing around, too. It was <laughs> pretty good. You know, of course, we try to prevent the you know, a couple of comrades. They just love that floating gear. And the reason the comrades love the floating gear is because it gives them a perfect perch over the water. And the amount of bait that my gear holds on a daily basis, you can just get in the water with a mask and just see all that bait fish just trailing behind that gear. Uh, so it's like a feeding platform. It's just they're perfect. They just sit up there and boom, boom, you feed off your, off your gear all day. And then they come back and leave a mess on. That's, I swear, that's their favorite thing to do. Um, but we, we actually did a, um, a bird um, project last year, a bird deterrent study. Uh, that was through CMAC. Uh, we've got a mini grant to do um, some bird deterrent studies. I thought we did a pretty good report on that. We you know, took um, three different types of bird deterrents, put them on, on our gear. We used um, some, some spikes. We had some of these pin needles. And we had some of the uh, plastic spikes. And then we did a kind of an assessment, not just of the you know successfulness of the deterrent itself, you know, did it deter birds, because most of them pretty well deter the birds. Um, but then the durability and then the cost analysis from a business perspective things. And we did a nice write-up on that to you know feedback and to see that and they've used that, that for a few different things now. And there is, you know, talking about CMAC, so you guys don't know, uh, CMAC is the Southeastern Massachusetts Agriculture Center. And there's also MEMAC, Western Massachusetts Agriculture Center, and then MEMAC, Northeast Massachusetts Agriculture Center. But right now, um, we've been dealt with a blow in the industry uh, where MEMAC is not operating anymore. That was operating out of the Cat Code um, Marine Lab at Salem State, but um, that kind of got COVID canceled. And um, there was a bunch of stuff that went on, and it's, you know, state shows that that was the program that we did at Costco. And so that program at Costco, um, but that's a state funded program. So we should have that here to promote agriculture. We're going to turn that tide, you know, to get some more, you know, blue collar industry working with the ocean on the North Shore. We need that type of a thing because. I'm in. There, there's really no other agriculture right now that's still active on the North Shore. There was the muscle lines off the Rockport, but those are no more. And those were, once again, a lot of regulations, a lot of difficulty uh, because those were not in state water. Then they were not going to be governed by state rules and regulations, nor were you going to be allowed to land your product, Massachusetts state ports. So, because it was a federal market. So they wanted federal, but it just became too difficult. So you couldn't even do it um, just based because of regulations. And um, it was it was a shame, and they got left abandoned, and um, they got damaged um, out there. So um, they're gone, and uh, the, the site still exists. Somebody can try to do something out there, but I don't know. Um, especially mussels. Mussels are a, an interesting uh, piece of shellfish to to raise. You know, we're not doing mussels at my site, but we are licensed for them. Uh, we did permit, you know, when I went through the permitting process, I permitted for more than I was allowed to do. Uh, as far as um, space went, uh, I permitted for a bigger area than I owned. Um, I permitted for um, every species I possibly could put on the ground. Uh, just, you know, kelp, everything. So that, that way, if I do want to change something, or try something new, I don't have to go back through a process to do it again. Is the two permits, you have the agriculture permitting process, then you have your yearly propagation process. So propagation permit you get once a year. Um, and that you can then say, okay, well, you know, I'm already cleared by the town, cleared by the state through this other form of shellfish. So then you just have to check it off on the propagation permit, tell this, tell the state, tell the person, yes, okay, we also that we're gonna start scallops this year, base scallops, which is actually something I'm very interested in. Um, so that way they can monitor what they need to monitor, which is where are you getting shellfish seed from and where are you introducing new shellfish to. And that's more of a yearly permit basis versus, you know, okay, what kind of species may you try, which is more your, your one time permit. Um, I think that's that last slide. So, yes, open for questions, conversation.
Oh, where was that? Where in Northport was that muscle? Um, I guess experiment taking place. Uh, it was uh, it was a couple of miles off the South Ages. Okay, so it was, it was yeah, it was it was outside of the three mile limit. Yeah, so it's definitely federal water. Uh, uh, yeah, abandoned and destroyed. So yeah, how long were they out for? They had the muscle lines four or five years, something like that. Yeah, the muscle lines out there. Uh, there was one other guy. That was, so was it like a new regulation that? You can't like that made them stop, or did they just never get up and running? They just never really got up and running because it was a brand new thing. Yeah, and then now okay, we go, oh, they got to do that. Oh, this is federal water, not state water. Uh, so who do you talk to about where and what? These are not shellfish that are these are shellfish that are not raised in our jurisdiction, but in somebody else's jurisdiction and brought into our. It just gets messy. And part of it is because it's in federal waters. So we talked about the NSSP. In, in state waters, we are the state authority, so we're monitoring for biotoxins, we're looking for phytoplankton. Whereas in state waters, um, no one. Yeah, and, and so that's that's one of the problems, especially in mussels, because mussels we use as a sensible species because okay. they're the first ones to take up the toxin. So they're they're sort of like a real time indicator. They're your canary Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's another one of the issues yeah. is that their federal waters is less monitoring because the federal mm -hmm. government's responsible for it. But they have in the new little iteration of the model ordinance this new language about the responsibilities of the federal government in managing um, just managing the classifications of federal waters. So um, I don't I don't know how this is going to you know end up and how how the different frameworks are going to end up, but there are. Uh, other reasons for that, and one of them is the classification scheme and the monitoring. Because the thing is, you know, it's, it's all over the place. It's just like we come in a room, we don't know if half the people in the room have the flu, right? We make a hole and get the flu. That's kind of the same thing with the, 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 the plankton. We don't know whether there are a bunch of bad players in the plankton at that time. So, with nobody monitoring, it's, it's a public health risk. Right. On the back of that, I have to assume somebody has thought over. Might be potentially pursuing or investigating aquaculture and like within Vineyard Wing One as it's getting built out, and it seems like a great spot of land that's not being used otherwise. Is there any development on that? That's interesting. I think people are putting proposals out there to investigate it. I mean, obviously, it's an access issue, right? So it's so far off offshore that it's not easy to just check on things. If there's a storm that works. <laughs> Um, but there are proposals to investigate like, the ability for that to coexist on, you know, they have different platforms. And, um, I don't have a, a lot of knowledge about everything that's out there, but I've seen proposals mm -hmm. that people want to investigate. They do some offshore muscle up in Maine. Uh, Bangs Island uh, Muscles is a, is a successful operation. It works out for them. That's there. They've got what um, they call muscle rafts that they put out and they hang lines down off the raft. They call it a raft, but it's a pretty serious, uh, pretty serious location. And they leave them out there pretty a long time during the season. During the winter, they kind of move them in and then they move them back out again. Uh, so close to the They've got more sheltered areas there. That'd be something like that. At Gloucester, if you're going to do something like that, you'd be moving those muscle barges into the harbor for the winter and then moving them out back offshore again. You know, more for the summer and stuff. And then you get into your, um, you know, water quality areas again. You know, what's, you know, is Gloucester Harbor is a prohibited area. So Manchester here is a prohibited area. Um, I think Manchester has a better chance of getting, if they wanted to, um, to push the state to redo water quality testing um, to get something in Manchester that could be a possibility. But um, you, you never know. You know, if you look at the septic and the outputs and stuff like that, Manchester will be out for all. So you look at the other towns around you, but you know, Manchester might be nice and clean, but then you know, you're picking up something from Beverly or Salem or something that's you know, really causing a bigger problem than you realize. So the directors are more shorter here. But there have been a lot of improvements made um, on a lot of areas since the last time a lot of this water quality samples and full reports have been done. And there's a lot of stuff out there right now that's kind of like, well, just kind of let it. Don't really poke into this because um, it might not turn out 
this way or that way. You know, better to if people have the mindset a lot of places of let it sit how it is, because you don't want to, you know, upturn the apple cart too much. And if that happened, then you'd be responsible for that. You know, so it's, 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 there's a lot of that. And that. I have issues with my water quality um, area and the rain closures that we have. Um, well, I, I, I work, so you know, but it is, it is, you know, the question of, you know, how, you know, what are you going to do about it? You know, we're looking into some of the data. I think data can be, you know, should be more accurate than what it is. That would help me a lot better. Um, try and work that through a couple of the organizations that are in my part, my, my, my growing area, and for um, designated. And so we also have right in the river with us, we have uh, Woods Hole. Um, it, it's right there with their marine labs, and they're doing water quality samples up and down the river at the time. So my goal is to work through them to get their data and then hopefully get their data integrated with the state data to then give me give better data so that then maybe we don't have to have an eight day rain closure after the one inch rain event um, for the entire plant on the side, which I still feel is very restrictive, but that's where we're at. So, um, but, so we have that data and at least um, make the case, uh, you know, here we are. That's what we have. So that's where we work. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot to uh, getting things started and going. Um, but then again, once you get it up and running, and you're like, oh boy, now I can do it. <laughs> so the tangential question to this, there's a few things that were mentioned that could be better in the industry, right? So like kelp dry, there's not a big source to do that to the the environment efficiently. But being new, like what, what are some things that could be improved that would be beneficial? So like transporting the water. So I would like to see, so first off, we, we need a new MEMAC. We need a Northeast Agriculture Center. It's probably the state budget that would then, then support us as a hatchery system. That's more of a business important. that could help the community or the farmers, right? That's what I mean. Like, how could you be more profitable if somebody else came in and provided transport or drying or whatever? What are those? So, so the best stuff, um, I think that stuff would be there. Uh, you know, the businesses will follow if there is the market for that. You know, so the market is there. So if you look at Maine as an example, Maine is doing gangbusters right now with kelp. They've got a lot of kelp farms, a lot of kelp startups, um, a lot of area that they've opened up to this. So getting the spot like is, is difficult, right? So getting that location is, is really the hands to. After you have the location, um, you know, if, if it's you know, the right town, you know, if the support from your local municipality is, is the number number two. You know, they, they go kind of hand in hand. You know, you get that location and town approval. Um, one of the things that's prevented kelp right now from starting up, in my opinion, is um, back to how you know we have to block off a latitude longitude set. I need a box, and then I get exclusive access in that box. Um, that's your old school. Um, my analogy is, has been for years now is your cattle rancher versus sheep farmer situation. Yeah, free range cattle, they've got all use of the ocean, get your lobster men, get your land diggers, all that. Your agriculture now, here's your sheep farmer, he comes in, hangs off the section, but he else is allowed to use this. That's a problem. That pits agriculture against bioproducers. And if we could get rid of that regulation for cow farming, and just say, okay, every lobsterman out there, you want to go kelp farming? Check the box on your form, on your, your, your lobster license renewal form. Don't charge them anything, just check the box, let them go figure out kelp farming on their own. There's a lot of lobstermen that would go and try it. And even better is they would fit in kelp where kelp grows best because they know the ocean up there, they're working at the entire lines. That to me would be the number one thing we could do to kickstart kelp agriculture here on the North Shore. One of the big problems I see with agriculture permitting is the tendency to treat all agriculture and all species of agriculture the same for permitting purposes, two purposes, when they're not the same. I mean, you know, soft shell clams are different than oysters. Hard shell clams are different than soft shells. Um, they're more related, similar, and definitely, you know, more closely related than kelp would be to anything like that, but it's still, you know, different species, different methods of, of you know, farming. That. You know, you do all um, floating gear oyster, 
aquaculture. The gear never touches the bottom. You're never using that gear in the same area that a clam digger would be digging soft shell clams, right? Because it's just floating in the water. You can't dig soft shells underwater. So those two things shouldn't be forced to compete against each other or to be exclusively one way or the other. You could have that work side by side. And you know, if people can see more of that where you're not taking something from somebody else to do your thing, then that's the kind of stuff that I think will open up more you know, aquaculture-based projects and work. But um, while you still have this conflict between an, you know, a, a wild harvest situation and an agriculture farming situation, that's just gonna, you know, that's where you get the NIMBYs come out. That's why um, Essex specifically, Ipswich specifically, do not allow oyster agriculture accounts because the clam diggers said, no, we don't want that. And there's a lot of clam digging families there that, you know, bonded together and they, they're soft shell is their thing. But in that town, these towns, that's where that municipal program can be, you know, taken advantage of more to do more, you know, wild seeding of the flats. So then you now, once again, we're doing something with agriculture that isn't in conflict with the wild harvesters. Now an agriculture project, once again, hatchery with soft shell seeds, give seeds to the clam diggers, let them populate those seeds out where they feel it's best in the marsh. And you know, that's that's a piece of agriculture that would be successful and that would support that. I mean, there's a big industry of clam digging up here in the North Shore. You know, where I sell my Ipswich shellfish. You know, I'm the only guy that's bringing oysters in on the dock. <laughs> and you know, I got all these other guys bringing in uh, clams right next to me going, where are them coming from? <laughs> Nowhere. They just, you know, don't mind these, you know, they're going to the back, you know. But there's a huge industry there. And, you know, we should be supporting that industry. That's what we're going to be the Emax that I backed up against. That was the only source of soft shell clam seed. And that was right at Cat Cove, and now with that gone, you know, there's a whole section that we just, we can't do that stuff. We have to buy it. There's one place up in Maine on soft shell clam seed. And last time I talked to them, they're like, oh, yeah, 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 great. Oh, yeah, where are you at? Massachusetts. <laughs> you know, I got a lot of guys from Maine that are ahead of you, buddy. I don't think you're going to get any this year. Okay. All right. Let's get to the next. So, where do we go? I had my first year was um, I had 100,000 soft shells on, on reservation with Salem State. It was the capital of us. And uh, that was in the head to shut down. So, I messed up on that because I was. And talk about it. Oh, we're going to do that one last set, that one last set, and we'll get you in that one last set. We'll have that for you. So not, we missed out on that. So we've had some challenges there with different hatcheries. Um, we learned that one this year. We have to switch gears with our oyster seed. Uh, we have to switch gear with our cohog seed. We have to go, for, uh, go from Island Creek to uh, ARC for cohogs, and then I have to go up to Maine for uh, my oyster seed this year. So hopefully, uh, that works out again next year. Right now, we've already had a couple of announcements from uh, well, first Island Creek is not selling seed uh, for this season. Um, so they, had issues, they had issues with, with the seed out of the Duxbury. So they're only going to be providing seed to the Duxbury uh, farms here in their ecosystem. And then um, ARC called me another hatchery down the Cape, probably one of the most established hatcheries. And they're already yeah, looking okay, advanced orders now. Uh, and it's going to be a cap in their orders this year, which they've never capped their orders before. Uh, they had problems with two, two crops last year. And then uh, we were very lucky to get that seed out of, um, out of Maine, but uh, Mook seed farm up in Maine, which is probably, I, I, I would, my opinion again, they're probably one of the best hatcheries in New England, if not the best. Um, they had two years ago, they had their entire crop fit. Which was devastating. They, they like um, now they've adjusted and started adding some calcium to the into the hatchery process just to get those shells building up a little quicker and faster in those minuscule little <laughs> baby oysters. Um, that seems to maybe solve their problem. Uh, they had a pretty good set this year, but um, once again, they're they're also on the on the sending out their emails now. Where you know looking for seed reservations when um, seed reservations from Mook. Yeah, typically we'd be doing those end of January, beginning of February. You know, once they get their first crop established and they take reservations, now it's pre-reservations with deposits. Make sure we 
getting it out of your seed. And that's that's like what you know, if I don't get my seed, um, I don't I don't farm that seed. That's, that's that's very important. You know, eventually we're hopeful to you know get our own hatchery situation set up. Um, but you know, this other state regulations and challenges and you know, we have to other DEP we have to deal with and you know water waste laws along with the DMF, along with the you know those extra pathogen tests to get done which um, don't schedule very easy and don't get you know there's a lot to go through for that but um, hopefully a couple of years um you know, to get our own hatchery because i feel very strongly that without your own hatchery uh, you're just going to always be dependent on others until we get that set up that you won't really have your business independence but that's longer term you know we got our first first harvest <laughs> Hopefully we'll have another good harvest uh, come up this week. We're gonna go do a count today, see what else we have for harvestable stuff. Uh, we get out of our rain closure on Tuesday, hopefully, and uh, have just some time for Thanksgiving harvest. So. Any, any other questions? I'm assuming that you, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, I'm assuming you guys went over budget. Well, your initially planned budget was like the biggest kind of surprise hurdle that you guys had to kind of overcome. Um, the banana issue seemed pretty expensive, but was that more just time or was that actually materials that you lost a lot of? That was just, it's just time experimenting materials. Uh, we loved, you know, I got out of that side, lose any oysters. That was a big thing to keep them alive. Mm -hmm. Got those six floating cages set up really quick. And then, uh, you know, got that moved over. Um, that was time. We used a lot of, we used and repurposed a lot of the gear there. So that didn't, you know, hit as hard as it could. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I think the, the the biggest thing was time. It spent time, you know, resetting through the um, permitting process was difficult. You know, we had to reset a couple of times. I ended up having three or four town meetings. Yeah. You know, oh wow. Okay. Yeah. And there's a big nippy attitude towards shellfish farms, noisy farms. The not in my backyard crowd. Yeah. You know, it's huge. There's been a lot of farms up and down the coast uh, that have had that problem, have not been approved for expansions. And um, because of that, or you know, have you know their existing operations being threatened because um, people that have decided that they don't want this there. Or and they'll tell you, they'll tell you straight up. Holy spoilers, love this type of stuff. It's not, it's not here. Mm -hmm. It's not here. Yeah, I'm not, I can see that there from the house. I drive by the boat. They, 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 get, they get upset when they throw me awake, you know, and they get yeah, come on. <laughs> you know, but yeah, they, they, that's the biggest biggest threat to a lot of stuff in the, in the attitude. Not like that. Yeah, so that was kind of my question. How important is it that you own your land and being able to do this? I feel like. <laughs> That was key for me. Yeah, I feel like it's not really that feasible or worth the squeeze if you don't own land in terms of being able to have an opportunity to lease something. Right. So, in order, if you don't own the property, um, then you're leasing from the municipality. And right. as Chrissy mentioned earlier, then that gets into that residency requirement. Yeah. So, you have to be in a town that then has a shellfish <coughs> leasing bylaw right. um, for that. Um, no town on the North Shore has one. Rowley used to have one. That's still on the books that I get in under. Um, but then uh, you have to find a piece of land to purchase in order to do it. And then uh, they, there's waiting lists. Like I think Falmouth has a waiting list. Yeah, so you can't, even if you move to Falmouth, right. decide to set something up, you got to get on that waiting list to get, them, to get a lease spot. Um, and there's a few towns, if you look through the Cape, that you can move to and you would have a shot at getting a lease. I don't think it would be guaranteed. Would definitely be a bit of a roll of the dice, um, yeah. But you'd have to be a resident there, I believe. Um, you'd have to prove to a local shellfish constable that you are a uh, knowledgeable previous commercial shell fisherman in order to get a lease within a year. Otherwise, they'd have you have to be a commercial shell fisherman in that town for like a period of time before you would even be considered. So, th those are the, the some of the primary things. It means different. Maine is 100% um, statewide. You don't have to live in the town that you, you have your, your agricultural lease in. As long as the town is willing to give agricultural leases, anybody that in the state can get one in that town. Uh, and they get the same route uh, in New Hampshire as well. Rhode Island, is that the same? Yeah. 
Yeah, Rhode Island State Rights of Pan, Massachusetts is the only one there. That goes all the way back to colonial Massachusetts in those laws. So there's the, 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 the Holy Trinity, the three, right? You have the right on the low tide, on the low tide area of Massachusetts, the right to fish, fowl, and navigate. The Holy Trinity of property. So if you come in on the land and you walk on somebody's beach and they say, get the hell out of me, get the hell out of me. I'm very much a pal. You, yeah, you can't kick me off this beach. I did not cross your land to get here. I'm still within the title zone. Be it. Yeah, that's that's on a lot. It's, it's been challenged. Just to don't, you know, say, hey, this guy told me I could do this and you know, use me as an example. But there is that the laws on the books. That's kind of what we have to kind of get around because that's when you get your latitude and longitude coordinates. Then now I have exclusive access to all shellfish on that plot. And now no other, nobody done dig any of that. That's all. Yeah, exclusive there, so they have to stay off that area. So I can market the trespassing. There are actually only about a handful of our growers that actually own their intertidal property. Um, you could own property and Somebody, the town could lease land on your intertidal property with your permission. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the. So even if you own the intertidal property, the town has jurisdiction over the shellfish on your property. You would still need to get a license from the town. Yeah. So um, intertidal property is the most contentious, but um, Rundin, there's another one I think in Brewster. The only time you don't need a license from the town to operate is if. There's one spot up on the way short fits this. Exactly. Is if you have a man made pond that you can, you know, put some kind of uh, um, tide gate in. So, so that never was town, town marine property to begin with. You made that. So that person does not require a license from the town. A tidal saltwater pond that is man made completely on your property. You do not need a town license to agriculture. Yep. There is. One of these on the North Shore, <laughs> and uh, I bought that person's here all day when he decided to cut it off and sell it. So that's not even operating. Well, that was in essence. Uh, uh, why did he stop him? Uh, he didn't own the place. Um, so it, was, it was somebody else's land. It was small, it was tiny. It's tiny. Uh, his water flow wasn't the best, so it was a slow grow. Um, he tried different things, bottom culture, he tried uh, floating cages. He had the best luck with the floating cages because they were the best. But the floating cages and the tide pump are two, so are just the way to go. Uh, they're the best for, for multiple reasons on, on actual growing shellfish. Uh, but yeah, he tried all this different stuff. I mean, he had a couple of successful crops, but he never, he was never big. I think the most he bought was like, you know, he was under 10,000 seed, you know, and he was just experimenting with that. Um, but he's got a long history in agriculture. He's definitely a, a good friend. He has done quite a bit. Um, he's definitely got the PTSD. <laughs> and, uh, the shellfish farm. <laughs> going through the permitting process. He got kicked out of that switch. He got he found the spot on Essex to use, and then that didn't work. And, you know, Dick's friends. So, you know, but he's still still very active in shellfish. He's, he's a great resource. He, he, he knows a lot. So, we'll get excited. He was just when he was done, so yeah, I'll take you to whatever you want to work straight. Yeah. So I bought him up before he got to use some of that the first year, and then we yeah, gradually up to you know, a lot more stuff. Like, I have a question. If there, like, if regulation was just gone today, is there anything that you would add, like, overnight, like, kelp or fishery or anything like that? Is there anything that you would expand to? If you want to love you, it's just a matter of time. Time and ability, you know. Yeah. Like, that's, that's the thing. I'd love, I'd love to do some, do some kelp. Uh, uh, so that I would like to see kelp get started. But like I said, I don't want to do the kelp as much as I'd like to enable the lobster man to be able to do kelp. Mm -hmm. That's kind of more where I'd like to see that happen because I think kelp could be huge. Kelp could be huge for Gloucester, huge for this area, you know, not just the um, farming with the kelp, but then all the shoreside work too. You know, you bring it in, you dry it. We have the places to do this. We have the infrastructure. It's just sitting there unused in a lot of cases. Um, we're easy to set up and, and be transferred right over the kelp and, and start a big kelp process. And then you also have, you know, old food manufacturer stuff too. You could, you could start doing things with that kelp, that secondary product as well. You know, not just the, you know, you dry the kelp, you dry the kelp, the flour, dry it, you can have it 
we also just replace it, we chop it up, and we use it. Um, you know, and even even fertilizer stuff, you know, for, for different, you know, organic type fertilizer, you know, rocks from scraping that stuff too. So there's a lot of there's a lot that they could be done with it. It's just, it's just so close. You know, and, and with the with the um, the right whales, there's a very big focus on right whales right now with all the right perspectives. Um, a little bit to the point where some of it's, um, in my opinion, again, is, is one sided and some of it's error on the side of caution. A lot of it's error on the side of caution. I had to get um, right whale um, you know, approvals from my side. And I, I literally went back to the people saying, if you can show me proof that you ever have documented proof of a right whale coming up inside Plum Island Sound, <laughs> then we'll talk about it. But until you have documented proof of whales coming up inside Plum Island Sound, because the only reason a right whale is coming inside Plum Island Sound is if it's going there specifically to die. Yeah. <laughs> no, they do not come up in, in, that, in rivers like that. That's way too far up inside the estuary for a whale. Um, it'd be just amazing if you ever saw it, but then unfortunately, I think it would be a tragic tale. Uh, and that the same thing with, with the sea turtles. Sea turtles are also concerned. Um, but once again, you know, we don't get there's not a lot of sea turtle that comes into the estuary or anything like that. Not up, not up in area. They are typically out in the open water to see them. Yeah, they're coming to which bay or they're going off the rocks or something like that. But um, you know, that's a big current for them to fight to come inside that estuary. Yeah, the mouth of the Ipswich River is pretty flows pretty good at most times, and then you look at the area, it's just you know, not much, yeah, they don't come in against that. You know, they can smell that too. You know. <laughs> I think it's I want to respect your time so much so you can get out there on the water and do what you need to do. Um, it's, it's time for lunch. So thank you so much, Brendan. Great. Thank you guys.